So uh, hello, good morning, afternoon, and good evening to all speakers, chairs, and wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the SNS webinar. The speaker for the first session today is our distinguished guest from Japan, Professor Kiyoshi Takagi. Professor Takagi is the director of the Normal Pressure Hydrocephalus Center at the Abiko Shinjikai Hospital. He was a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Fujita Health University, Japan. He's an important member of the Japan Neurosurgery Society. His research interests are focused upon the management of cerebral vascular diseases, disorder of cerebral spinal fluid, especially normal pressure hydrocephalus. He's a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and he will be talking about epidural gas injection, a high effective treatment for chronic post traumatic headache and mild traumatic brain injury. The speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from China, uh, Professor Wu Zuming. Professor Ming is an associate professor of neurosurgery at the Huasan Hospital, Fudan University, uh, Shanghai, China. His clinical interests are focused upon the management of skull-based surgery. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and today he will be talking about the deep uh, subaqua uh, fossa sign and three, three types of abnormalities, uh, subaqua uh, loops encountered during vestibular swanoma removal. The chair for the first session today is our honored guest from uh, India, Professor Vijaya Shekhar. Professor Vijaya Shekhar is the professor and head of neurosurgery at the Andhra Medical College, Vishakapatnam, India. He's an important member of the Neurological Society of India as well as Tra Neuro Trauma Society of India. He's a, a center working committee member of the India Medical Association. He has received several awards and honors for his outstanding contributions in neurosurgery in his country. He's a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Kiyoshi Takagi. The chair for the second session today of our webinar is our honored guest from Brazil, Professor Gustavo Jung. Professor Jung is a consultant neurosurgeon specialized in skull-based surgery at the Neurological Institute of Curitiba. He's a member of Brazilian Society of Neurosurgery and Brazilian Academy of a neurosurgery. He was a previous skull based fellow at the Tübingen, Germany. He has published several articles in various peer review journals. We are extremely thank thankful to him uh, for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Zumi. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both speakers and chairs and the uh, wonderful audience of this online platform. A warm welcome to our colleague in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. With that introduction, I will hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Vijaya Shekha. Professor Vijaya, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Boon Lu, uh, the secretary of the ACNS for webinar for today. And uh, thank you all the esteemed members and all the other panelists and chairpersons and uh, uh, listeners. Uh, good evening to you all. Good morning and good night to the people in other countries. I am Happy to <coughs> chair this session by Professor Kiyoshi Takagi, who has done extensive studies and the publications upon the epidural gas injections. If we look back, this epidural <coughs> blood patch was in Sorry. most epidural blood patch was most in commonly in vogue for uh, post spinal headaches originally. Subsequently, a lot of work has been done and uh, it was also useful for the conditions where there is conditions simulating the intracranial hypotension. Takagi has already published his work upon epidural gas injection along with the saline and uh, we will be very happy to listen from him rather than wasting time. I now introduce Professor Takagi to present his uh, experience. Professor Takagi, Thank please. Thank you. Thank you for introducing, uh, inviting me to this nice meeting. Uh, my talk is about epidural gas injection, uh, EGI, a highly effective treatment for chronic post-traumatic headache and uh, myelotraumatic brain injury. There is no COI for this study. Uh, Uh, first, uh, it's introductory part. Chronic post-traumatic headache 
uh, or mild traumatic brain injury are quite serious problem in the United States, Japan, and all over the world. The number of the patient is estimated over 10 million. This is a famous uh, uh, American magazine, National Geographic, uh, February 2015 issue. It features uh, a mild traumatic brain injury in the war returnee from uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And uh, uh, they have many serious problems, uh, headache, uh, mood change, and uh, uh, sleeplessness, uh, but uh, there is no visible damage to the brain. So this is in the invisible work on the brain. One of the war returnee uh, uh, made this sculpture, left side. It expressed their agonizing pain. And uh, the right side shows a uh, uh, picture was drawn by one of my uh, patients. She was not a warrior, but uh, she suffered only from a uh, very tiny, mild uh, injury. But the agonizing pain are very similar. And studies on mild traumatic play injury have been published in major medical and scientific journals. This is the monstrous journal, New England Journal of Medicine. In 2008, a mild traumatic brain injury in US soldiers return, returning from Iraq was published. But the conclusion is very simple. Mild traumatic brain injuries occur, occurring among soldiers developed Iraq, uh, uh, deployed in Iraq is strongly associated with PTSD and the physical health problems three to four months after the soldiers return home. PTSD and depression are important mediators of the relationship between mild traumatic brain injury and the physical health problem. These are the list of uh, their uh, symptoms. Uh, physical symptoms such as headache, dizziness, uh, constipations and fatigue. Uh, other post-concussive syndromes are uh, memory problems, balance problem, ringing in eye, ear, ears, concentration problems, and irritability. Signs and symptoms were multiple and very severe, but there is no visible brain damage. And in 2011, almost also in the New, New England J Journal of Medicine, uh, another study was published. Detection of a blast-related traumatic brain injury, US military pers personnel. Uh, the conclusion is also very simple. Many of these subjects did not have abnormalities on diffusion tensor image. Traumatic brain injury remains a clinical diagnosis. Many uh, clinical institutes uh, created uh, studying uh, mild traumatic brain injuries by blast injury trauma. Uh, one of the model is this and uh, this shows that uh, uh, blast to the body uh, conducted its uh, energy by uh, just like tsunami effect to the brain. And uh, this is the uh, cause of brain damage by uh, blast trauma. But I don't think this model is not true. Now I will sh show you some case presentations treated by epidural gas injection. Representative cases of chronic post-traumatic headache, 
or mild trauma to brain injury traded by epidural gas injection. The brain and spine MRIs were normal in all cases. Uh, firstly, I have to explain short form 36. I not, I'm not sure you're familiar to this system. This is evaluation system of uh, uh, survey health status in medical outcomes. It consists uh, eight for eight part, uh, physical function, role physics, body pain, general health, uh, vitality, social function, role emotional, and mental health. Uh, this octagonal parachute chart can uh, show very easily their uh, health, health state. And uh, a dotted line indicates 50. It shows that Jap normal Japanese people. This 36 male, uh, he, he was once a professional boxer. 17 years ago, uh, she suffered, he suffered from short period of loss of consciousness while boxing. After that, he complained also static headache, dizziness, blood vision, easy fatigability. Uh, that's mean he suffered from typical mild traumatic brain injury. Symptoms worsened gradually. Symptoms were influenced by the climate, atmospheric change. He received only one time epidural gas injection. The left side shows the change of the short from 36 before and after the treatment. Inside the blue line shows the uh, pre treatment state. Uh, far behind the normal state. Three months after the treatment, uh, the red line shows the uh, very good improvement. Actually, he recovered very soon, uh, just one day after the treatment. This uh, right side graph shows the movement of uh, uh, eye and uh, size of pupil. Uh, it shows uh, uh, the uh, accommodation function. Before treatment, he complained uh, photophobia, and uh, this shows the uh, abnormal function of pupillary uh, dilation, uh, pupillary uh, dilation, and and uh, uh, constriction. But after the treatment, uh, the accommodation function is normal. This is uh, a very useful uh, device to measure accommodation function. And, uh, uh, but it is not available now. This 46 man uh, was suffered from traffic accident six years up. And uh, after that, he complained very severe pain and get disturbance, unsteady, unsteadiness. Uh, this is before treatment. And uh, just after three days, he's almost normal. He received only one time epidural gas injection. Uh, this is a change of uh, uh, short from 36. And uh, uh, it shows a very drastic improvement. Oh, only one time epidural gas injection. Right side sh uh, shows that uh, um, uh, balance uh, function. Upper two shows the very unsteady standing, but after treatment, only one months after treatment, he can stand very steadily. The balance is very, uh, quite normal. In our daily work, uh, clinical work, these patients uh, are easily diagnosed as post-traumatic neurosis or PTSD. 
and uh, they will receive some medication or psychotherapy. Now, I move to the definition and the history of chronic post-traumatic headache or a mild traumatic brain injury. As you know, uh, international classification of headache disorders, second version, uh, published in 2004, uh, classified chronic post trauma, chronic headache after chronic headache after trauma, uh, classified 5.2 chronic post traumatic headache, and the chronic post traumatic headache attributed to mild headache is cl classified as 5.2.2. In the latest version of this classification, uh, third edition, published 2018, the term chronic has been changed to persistent, but the essential meaning is the same. In the second version of uh, international classification of headache disorder, there is a comment on chronic post-traumatic headache. Chronic post-traumatic headache is often part of the post-traumatic syndrome, which includes a variety of symptoms such as equilibrium disturbance, poor concentration, uh, decreased workability, irritability, depressive mood, sleep disturbances, etc. According to the uh, international classification of headache disorders, uh, mild traumatic brain injury is included in chronic post-traumatic headache. This is, uh, shows the relationship between chronic post-traumatic headache and mild traumatic brain injury. But uh, there is another definition of mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, defined by American Association of American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine in 1993. Uh, a patient with mild traumatic brain injury is a person who has had a, trauma, a traumatically induced physiological disturbance of brain function as manifested by at least one of the following. One, any period of loss of consciousness. Two, any loss of memory or for events immediately before or after the accident. Three, any alteration in mental state at the time of the accident, e.g. Uh, feeling dazed, disoriented or confused and for focal neurological deficits that may or may not be trans transient. But where the severity of the injury does not exceed the following. One, loss of consciousness for approx uh, of appro approximately 30 minutes or less. Two, after 30 minutes, an initial Glasgow coma scale of 13 to 15, and post-traumatic amnesia not greater than 24 hours. Uh, the symptomatology of uh, MTBI. The above criteria defines the event of mild traumatic brain injury. Symptoms of brain injury may or may not persist for varying lengths of time. After such a neurological event, it should be recognized that the patient with mild traumatic brain injury can exhibit persistent emotional, cognitive, behavioral, and physical symptoms alone or a combination, which may produce a functional uh, dis dis disability. These symptoms generally fail into one of the following categories and uh, additional events that, uh, that uh, MTBI has occurred. One, physical symptoms of brain injury. 
two, cognitive definition, three, behavioral changes. Uh, and the, the essence of the definition of mild traumatic in, brain injury by uh, American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine is a trivial head and neck injury, short period of loss of consciousness, and many life disturbing symptoms, but no abnormalities on CT or MRI. As I show you, uh, the relationship of uh, chronic post traumatic headache and uh, mild traumatic brain injury is just like this. So in this presentation, I use only chronic post-traumatic headache. And now I show you historical, historical aspect of chronic post-traumatic headache. Uh, one interesting historical case involved a 26 year old male servant who had been hit over the head with a stick and complained of retrograde amnesia. Six months later, she was still complaining of headaches, dizziness, tinnitus, and tiredness. A judge requested the opinion of Swiss physician, J.J. Wepper, and two other surgeons who stated, we cannot say anything definite, but it is certain that this will leave its mark in the form of an impediment. Although similar prognostic opinions are still given, this particular statement was made in 1694, 17th century. But uh, the number of uh, uh, chronic post-traumatic headache uh, is uh, dramatically increased after the development of the steam locomotive. Uh, in 1866-7, uh, John Eric Erickson published Railway and Other Injuries of the Nervous System. He described symptoms in after railway accident. He called it spinal concussion. No outstanding damages, bleeding or fracture, but they complained headache, dizziness, numbness in extremities, photophobia, and other many symptoms. Uh, medical legal problems with Valley Company has also occurred in this period. In the early 20th centuries, uh, people used car frequently, and the number of traffic accidents from, uh, increased uh, dramatically. Uh, Wilder Penfield treated this patient and published a very nice paper, Chronic Meningeal Post-Traumatic Headache and its specific treatment by lumbar air insufflation, encephalography. It says that PEG is an effective treatment modality. I think you don't know PEG, pneumoencephalography. Pneumoencephalography is developed by Walter Dundee in 1919. Uh, this is the uh, system, uh, and this is uh, pneumoencephalography. You can see airs in uh, skull, but uh, this uh, is no more used because uh, CT and MRI are developed. And uh, I will show you current treatment modality for chronic post-traumatic headache. Uh, a very nice review of this topic is available in 2020. Treatment outcomes in mild traumatic brain injury a systemic review of randomized controlled trial. Uh, there are uh, three types of uh, uh, treatment, education and early intervention rehabilitation. Two, psychological intervention, the pharmacotherapy. But the conclusion is very simple. 
there is currently a drought of good quality evidence to conclusively recommend the best approach to treat patients with mild traumatic brain injury. So historic, I will tell you historical aspect of the method and the method of epidural gas injection. As I show you, uh, air injection into the nervous system is developed by Walter Dundee in, in 1990. And uh, after that, uh, epidural air injection was developed by Henry Weber in 1941. It is, uh, the purpose of this method is uh, diagnostic, not for treatment. Uh, epidural gas injection was developed uh, for the uh, treatment was developed by a uh, Romanian uh, gynecologist, Matthias Matthias. And he developed air injection, uh, epidural air injection in for, uh, 1941, and it was published in 1953. But it was written in German, so the, this procedure is not spread widely. So uh, most of the uh, uh, neurosurgeon or uh, uh, physician do not know this technique. In 2009, I applied epidural gas injection. Uh, this is the whole spine MRI, uh, T2 image. This is before treatment, right left side is before treatment, and the right side, uh, right side is after injection of oxygen. Although the oxygen was in, injected from lumbar site, it goes up to neck for, neck for very rapidly. And the target of chronic post-traumatic headache is not brain or spinal cord. Uh, that the target is hip, uh, sacral epidural space. I will show you a method of epidural gas injection. First, uh, mark the uh, sacral hiatus and uh, use this spinal tap needle. Uh, this is the uh, needles I use, a spinal needle and uh, soft um, manometry. Uh, it has uh, air filter. It is very safe. Then uh, puncture the sacral hiatus by uh, loss of resistance method. And then inject air slowly into the epidural space through sacral uh, hiatus uh, up to uh, the maximum amount is about 100 millimeters. It took only about 10 minutes. And uh, although the air was injected, injected from sacral portion, as I show you, it goes up to neck. It takes only 10 minutes. Then I will show you the diagnostic criteria of chronic post-traumatic headache. This is the definition of chronic post-traumatic headache treated by epidural gas injection. Headache must be associated with other symptoms such as dizziness, blood vision, and concentration problems. Headache and other symptoms developed within seven days after the injury. Symptoms persist over three months after its onset. Symptoms worsen by keeping upright position and improves by laying. It resembles uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Symptoms worsen by low atmospheric pressure. The patient has experienced long-term disability in daily life by headache and other symptoms. 
the patient has no has not had uh, the patient has not had such severe headache before the injury. The patient has no definite neurological deficits such as motor palsy, uh, but uh, some patient shows mo uh, numbness or uh, uh, power loss. But neuroimaging studies do not show any abnormalities that can explain the headache and other symptoms. The patient has already received several treatment in vain. Although the symptoms resembled, resemble those of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, the intracranial pressure are, no, no, are not low. These are the symptoms other than headache, neck pain, back pain, lumbago, whole body pain, just like fibromyalgia, vertigo or dizziness, tinnitus, uh, hyperacusia, eye pain, blood vision, uh, focused impairment, decreased visual acuity, uh, diplopia, photophobia, taste disorder, smell disorder, muscle weakness uh, or low grip power, uh, gait disturbance, general fatigue, just like chronic fatigue syndrome, memory disturbance, loss of concentration, insomnia, depression, diarrhea, uh, it's uh, water, watery diarrhea, constipation, urinary incontinence, decreased libido, impaired body temperature, body temperature control, hyperhidrosis, blood pressure control dysfunction, just like orthostatic dysfunction. Immune disorders such as food allergy, hay fever. These signs and symptoms disappeared shortly after the treatment. So uh, I'm, uh, then uh, I will show you my personal data. These are the patients treated by epidural gas injection. It's include uh, some patient not traumatic origin. I have 460 traumatic origin and not traumatic origin was 69. The, the cause of accident is traffic accident is uh, 341, sports accident 46, five, Fall down 16, iatrogenic such as lumbar puncture or epidural puncture is 23, violence 9, industrial accident 15, daily movement uh, 7, and cough uh, causes chronic headache in four cases. This is age distribution of uh, 550 cases. Uh, mean age was uh, 39.2, and uh, the number of patients male versus female is 246 and 296. It means female dominant disease. And this is the distribution of intracranial pressure measured by lumbar puncture. I measured in 386 cases. Main ICP was 144 uh, millimeter H2O. In male, uh, it was 154. In female, 136. Uh, the distribution is like, just like this. In some patient, uh, although the uh, headache is just like uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, they show very high intracranial pressure. I call it uh, paradoxical intracranial hypertension. And uh, the uh, intracranial pressure is uh, significantly lower in female. This is outcome of 100, uh, 50, uh, 540 
uh, cases uh, treated by epidural gas injection. Complete cure in 83, uh, excellent. It means return to normal life with some symptoms such as headache, uh, 225. Good, good means a marked improvement, but not return to work in 145. Uh, fair. fair means only temporary improvement. In 57, no effect in therapy. I have no patient who worsened by this method. So uh, the effective rate is 94% and uh, very good uh, result obtained by 84%. And some, I show some more representative cases. Uh, this 36 uh, male uh, come from Sri Lanka, uh, uh, suffered from traffic, traffic accident. And before a treatment, he, he dragged, but only after one after, uh, one after treatment, he walked almost normally. This is 28. Uh, female suffered from traffic accident three months before. Left upside uh, shows the condition before treatment. She cannot even stand up. Very slow. Okay. And uh, only 10 minutes after the epidural gas injection, she can walk. So the effect of the epidural gas injection is instantaneous. This 44 years female suffered from traffic accident 10 months ago. Uh, she has severe pain and the uh, drug, working with drug, uh, but only after uh, this is a 26 years female suffered from sports access 10 years ago. Uh, she cannot even walk normally, but yeah. But after treatment, it's only one time treatment. The work improved drastically. So uh, this is the concluding the remarks. The conclusion is post-traumatic, uh, chronic post-traumatic headache can be treated by epidural gas injection. Epidural gas injection is easy and safe. Epidural gas injection shows its effect instantly. Treatment time is only 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, this is the Gordian's note. Thank you for your attention. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, that is a very nice presentation, Professor. Uh, I have a wonderful that you have largest series of about more than 540 cases. And it's uh, as seen from the videos, there is drastic and dramatic improvement in short span. That's very nice to see. I have a few uh, doubts. Sir, is there any specific, only oxygen is preferred or normal atmospheric air also can be injected, number one. Number, number one, two. what, 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 number one, what? Uh, is it only oxygen or atmospheric air also can be injected? Oxygen. If it is only, you, you have mentioned it is oxygen, is there any specific reason to choose oxygen? Uh, there is no specific reason to choose oxygen. Uh, any gas is okay. Recently, I inject helium, uh, sometimes room air. Uh, the point is increase epidural pressure. I think it is very important. Okay. 
and uh, so okay yes sir one more thing uh, uh, what is the quantity of the gas that is being injected quantity yes uh it's about 30 mm milli liter to up to 100 at the quantity of a uh, gas injection okay do not inject too much yes yes uh so that is uh, uh, good sir really good to know sir one more uh, part to discuss earlier the intracranial uh, hypotension spontaneous intracerebral hypotension was intracranial also a very rare entity uh, intracranial yeah intracranial hypotension Hi, not hypertension hypotension hypotension yes hypotension, hypotension. is supposed I experienced to be... many patients of uh, with intracranial hypotension it means uh, spin uh, csf leakage and uh, uh, in these cases i treat by epidural blood patching autologous yes. blood injection it's a usual yeah. method do you know yes. that method sir now with the advancement in the ct and mri techniques mm. there is more and more evidence that there are subtle changes if we carefully observe in the ct scan or mri scan in these mm -hmm. cases of intracranial hypotension like that are there any features mm -hmm. that we can now predict on radiological imaging well in the intracranial hypotension uh, there is uh, some typical uh, signs in mri uh, yes. such as uh, 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 subdural hematoma uh, dif uh, tonsillar descent yes, and uh, uh, tonsillar descent yeah. hmm. So well, it is very we... easy to diagnose intracranial hypotension, but uh, yes. uh, these patients I show uh, this presentation uh, resemble uh, to intracranial hypotension in their symptoms because they show also static headache and uh, uh, very uh, sensitive to atmosphere exchange. But they show uh, in some patients very high very high intracranial pressure, and uh, there is no abnormalities in the MRI or CT scan. Definitely normal. Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. We, uh, 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 Professor Liu. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Shall we move on to the next? Yeah. Can you, I sir? ask some question also, Professor? Yeah. So, Yes. yes, I want to ask Professor, during the procedure, if you accidentally uh, penetrate uh, in the subaronic space and get some CSF, so do you abandon <laughs> the procedure and how long yeah. after you retry this procedure? Well, uh, when we uh, proceed uh, this procedure uh, through uh, saclal hiatus, Mm -hmm. There is no chance to, uh, in the adult, there is no chance to uh, introduce a uh, uh, needle into the subarachnoid space. But when we uh, puncture at the lumbar level, uh, in some cases, uh, needle reached into subarachnoid space. So the uh, air was introduced into subarachnoid space. It caused very severe pain. And in this case, in this uh, situation, uh, I abandoned the uh, epidural gas injection and wait some period. Uh, we can see air in the brain and uh, just wait to uh, disappear of the air from the brain. There and is the, a one. Yes, Professor, please carry on. Uh, arachnoid membrane is very uh, uh, easy to close. So uh, I think uh, uh, one, 
uh, one week after the procedure, uh, we can try again. It's okay. Uh, professor, just, just how you mentioned the amount of air that you inject is between 30 to 100 uh, mils. Uh, there's a question from mm -hmm. Professor Amol. He was asking that, uh, when, how, when do you stop injecting the air, either 30 mil to 1,000 mil? Oh. Uh, is there a clinical sign that tell you, yeah, when do you stop? When, when the patient feel a uh, uh, headache or, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, stiffness, uh, I, I can stop. Uh, but usually uh, I can inject air up to 100 uh, with very safe. Yeah. There is another question from Professor Patula. He asked that after the procedure, how long after that you, you perform the MRI? How long after your procedure you perform the MRI? Well, uh, actually, I do not perform MRI after the procedure. Uh, I show the MRI with air just to show uh, how, uh, how high the air goes up. Uh, but usually, I don't uh, perform MRI after the procedure. So there's no no necessary to perform MRI. No necessary. Right? No, no necessary. Okay, and and you you did mention that uh, if one time is not successful, you can perform in a one week time. Is it? You can uh, repeat it in one week. Uh, about uh, twenty to thirty percent patient uh, need only one time uh, procedure, but. Uh, other patients receive uh, repeated, repeated procedure, repeated treatment. And uh, uh, in some patients, uh, they receive up to 100 times. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, very and, safe. Very safe. The interval is one week between each uh, time? Uh, interval is uh, uh, depending on the patient, one week or one month, or uh, in some patients. Uh, two or one year because uh, they, they are very good for a long time and uh, they come back because the symptoms come back. Okay, thank, thank you, Professor. Uh, those are the questions from the, our audiences. Uh, is, is there any other question? Professor Zumin, do you want to ask any question, Professor? Uh, we may call uh, upon uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Vijaya Shekha for the concluding remark, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Professor has very nicely narrated, starting from the historical aspects of uh, how uh, Dandy uh, has uh, introduced the intraventricular uh, air injection. From that, the old uh, publications to the recent trends. And uh, very nice to see the largest series of 500 plus patients getting treated. Still, I think there is a lot of scope for uh, the confirmation. You have nicely shown the objective improvement also, both the, by the gravity charts and other things, and also by the patient improvement clinically. However, uh, I think by more research or more uh, in-depth studies, uh, day is not far off that some of the uh, these can be demonstrated radiologically also, and we may find uh, in near future some of the uh, evidences for these, and we'll have a, a better thing. So that's what I wish to conclude. Thank you, Professor uh, Boonl, and uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Takaji uh, for a very nice lecture, and uh, Professor Vijaya Shekha for chairing this session. Now we move on to the uh, second session. I call upon Professor Gastawa Jung uh, to introduce our second uh, uh, speaker, Professor. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, to share again with you this nice uh, presentation we are having here right now. And the, the next speaker, Professor Xu Ming, he has published some nice paper recently in Acta Neurochirurgica. Uh, about the relationship of the ICA with the dura and the petrous bone that we may found during a post myeloma surgery. And if we already didn't have enough challenge in this surgery, this is an additional challenge that may sometimes even go avoid you to resect the tumor. So it's my pleasure to, to listen for, from you and we are uh, excited to, to see your experience in this, this topic. So uh, you 
may share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chu. Uh, Professor Chu, I remember five months ago, you gave us a wonderful lecture about the challenging, currently challenging vestibular lunar surgery. And today I talk about another challenge encountered during vestibular lunar removal. It was named as anomalous subacute loops. I'm Dr. Xu Ming. I'm from uh, Department of Neurosurgery of Huaxian Hospital, Shanghai, China. These are pictures of my hospital. This is the theme of our uh, scar based surgery. This is our professor, Zhong Ping. This is me. Disclosure I declare no conflict of interest associated with this talk. Uh, these are the contents of my lecture. First of all, let's know about the degeneration of the subarctic fossa. As you know, the subarctic fossa located on the posterior surface of the Petrus pyramid, which is located superlateral to the internal acoustic meters. Uh, in many mammals, the subarctic fossa is outpocketing of the posterior cranial fossa into the temporal bone. It is extended through the arch formed by the superior semicircular canal. Uh, so it was named subarctic fossa. It is parallel to the horizontal semicircular canal. It is extended to the mastoid and the vestibular labyrinth region of the petrous bone. Uh, in mammals, uh, it houses the petrous lobular of cerebellar parapolyphilus. A small piece of the cerebellum is uh, uh, protruded into the subarctic fossa. Uh, in mammals, in cats, the subarctic fossa is small, but it is a distinct fossa. In rabbits, monkeys, the uh, subarctic fossa uh, is very large. It houses the petrous lobular of the parapolyphilus. So, uh, and the size of PRP is associated with locomotor agility. Uh, in primates, in tree climbing animals such as small apes, the subject fossa is a relatively large volume, which houses the PRP. But uh, in great apes, living mostly on the ground, such as gorilla, we cannot find the uh, subject fossa. The volume of the adult form of FF has been highly reduced. In adult humans, the subarctic fossa is described as a rudimentary structure. Uh, it is exhibiting a shallow depression or narrow slit. Uh, the orifice of the subarctic fossa is concealed by the dural matter. So during CP angle surgery, uh, we did not find the this subarctic fossa. When we removed the uh, posterior wall of the internal artery meters, we cut the dura, the stupid dura, and then found the dura adhered tightly to the subarctic fossa. This is the, the site of subarctic fossa. Then we let's know about the maturation of the subarctic fossa. Uh, you, in human fetal stage, we can see. The subarctic fossa is a substantial pocket through the arch of superior super, uh, uh, semicircular canal. Uh, the immature fossa is filled with the dura connective tissue. And, uh, it at, uh, attains the greatest dimension between six and uh, seven months of gestation. In the fetus of seven months, the subarctic fossa is seen a form of a cylindrical cavity five millimeters in diameter and uh, seven to eight millimeters uh, in tips. After this stage, the subarctic fossa slowly but constantly decreases in size. After birth, we know with the rapid growth of the petrous bone and the pneumatization of the mastoid seals, the subarctic fossa lengthens and transforms into the subarctic the portion located lateral to the 
superior canal is completely obliterated in the uh, one and a half year of life. And the part located immediate to the superior canal is obliterated in, to its adult configuration of a shallow depression in the third year of life. We can see the adult config is a, a thunder shaped uh, fossa. The depth of subarctic fossa decreased with age and uh, it maintains the constant average adult depth of about one millimeter, one millimeters after three years of life. Uh, now let's know about the normal anatomy related to, to the subarctic fossa. And uh, at the bottom of the subarctic fossa, it gives rise arranging to the subarctic canal, uh, canal which is also known as a petrol mastoid canal. It connects the posterior canal fossa with the periangium mastoid seal. Both the subarctic fossa and SD houses the uh, matter and a subarctic blood vessels, blood, uh, subarctic artery and a subarctic vein. The length of the SC varies from the six to 10 millimeters. The SC is a potential route for infection from the middle year to the posterior fossa. It is also a route for CSF leakage after the vestibular swanoma removal. Uh, the subarctic artery uh, usually originated from the lateral pointing segment of the ACA. And uh, it penetrated the dura covering the subarctic fossa and uh, entering the SC. It supplies the otics capsule of semicircular canals, vestibular, the facial nerve canal, and the mastoid entrum. And uh, it anastomoses with several other arteries in the edge region, such as the optic artery, posterior meningeal artery, and the stylomastoid artery and the superficial pedal arteries. So separate the, uh, the subarctic artery is safe. During exposed uh, CP angle, we can find uh, some subarctic artery. A care should be taken to avoid to carry this artery because it is fixed in the uh, its point penetrating the dura. So avoiding the arranging of the subarctic artery here the parent echo will be result in having sector with the echo to control the bleeding. So you can graduate it, the artery here and uh, divide it here, then you can, you can protect the echo. And uh, the subarctic loop, as you know, the lateral pointing segment of the echo always form a loop named the meter loop to protrude the a direct toward the meters. It can also generate another convex loop. It was named the subarctic loop, which was directed toward the subarctic fossa. It was found in 70 and 15 CP angles. The apex of the loop was a canyon adhered on the dura of the subarctic fossa. At the point where the subarctic artery Arose. Uh, we can see some normal subarctic loop uh, located transverse the dorsal aspect of the vestibular swanoma. You can graduate it as, and uh, divide it as a subarctic artery and uh, then mobilize the subarctic loop uh, medially and inferiorly to expose the tumor. This is a normal subarctic loop. And uh, uh, the anomalous subarctic loop were first reported by uh, Professor Gore and Sika in 1991. And then the echo was adhered or penetrated into the dura in subarctic fossa. And uh, they carefully mobilized the uh, echo along with a sleeve of dura to preserve the, uh, to preserve the echo. Uh, in 2005, Rotten anatomy called attention to an anomalous subarctic fossa identified in a dissection specimen. 
in which the eye cut at the origin of the subacute artery was embedded in the dura and the bone surrounded the subacute fossa. They dured the bone around the vessel loop and uh, displaced the eye cut. And uh, in 2010, Warren reported eight cases of anomalous subacute loops with CV angle. The anomalous loop penetrated the, the dura in all eight cases and with bone involvement in three cases. And uh, two cases uh, during the mobilization of the ICA, the bleeding occurs, uh, occurred and the significant uh, uh, complication occurred in one patient. Uh, in 2018, uh, Kemper described during the subacute fossa to release the uh, ICA from the bone of the subacute fossa during a surgery of the vestibular swanomer removal. And uh, in 2019, Japanese surgeons named this artery loop a uh, challenging ICA. And uh, this uh, anomalous subacute loop of ICA can also be encountered during other CPNG surgery, such as epidermoid cystic removal and uh, microvascular decoperation of facial nerve. And uh, our work, we prospectively observed 1963 patients with newly and recently diagnosed vestibular swanoma who underwent surgical treatment in your team over a 10 year period. We identified 60 patients with a normal subacute loop. We can see the patient's age ranged from 19 to, 19 to 73. And uh, uh, most of this patient hearing, uh, preoperative hearing was grade C, grade D. Only two patients grade A, grade B. And uh, uh, the patient's age was similar to the other patient without anomalous subacute loop. But the tumor size uh, was significantly smaller than other uh, vestibular swanomers without anomalous subacute loop. 11 of the tumors uh, were solid and the five had uh, areas of cystic degeneration. None of the anomalous subacute loop is definitely diagnosed or preoperative MRI. According to the embedding site of the AICA beta, we classified them into three types. In type one, the apex of the subacute loop was embedded in the dorsal tumor capsule surrounding the subacute fossa. We just encountered one case. And uh, in type two, the apex of the subacute loop was embedded in the dura surrounding uh, the subacute fossa, eight cases. In type three, the apex of the subacute loop was embedded in the dura and the bone surrounding the subacute fossa, seven cases. Uh, for type one, uh, we rejected the cerebellum and, the, uh, and the, the apparent location of the facial nerve was identified and uh, we separated the vessel loop along the tumor capsule and the advent here of the ICA. The separation should be close to the tumor capsule to avoid damage to the advent here of the uh, ICA. And the bleeding should be fine coagulated. Uh, inner surface, there was no branches. So we could dissect it, uh, the, uh, the tumor capsule between and uh, the adventure of the ICA to preserve the ICA. But uh, in the outer surface, care should be taken because the uh, subarchite artery was embedded in the dorsal tumor capsule. Here, the bleeding occurred. We controlled it with regulation. And then we continue to dissect it. Then we found the point of the branchy bleeding 
the coagulated edge and the complete obliterated edge. And the eye was preserved. And then we mobilize this artery loop uh, immediately and inferiorly to expose the tumor. And the conclusion of the tumor removal, we uh, covered this artery with uh, a fibrin glue, and the Doppler was used to confirm the patency of the ACA. This is uh, type one. Uh, for type two, uh, it's uh, relatively easy. And uh, we cut uh, the dura around uh, the vessel loop. And uh, then stripped the dura away from the subarctic fossa. And the small artery was graduated. And uh, then we cut the dura and then mobilized the artery with a cut of dura and then we can expose the tumor. For type three, for the first four cases, uh, we removed the tumor from the terrestrial space after a retinoid dissection. We can uh, identify the pattern of the ICA entering and exiting the subacrophosa. For this case, uh, there was uh, enough space for tumor exposure and uh, tumor removal. So we firstly performed tumor debarking from the space superior to the vessel loop. All the procedure were performed from the perivascular space. And then we cut the dura overlying the posterior uh, meters and uh, the dura lining the subarctic fossa was used to protect the vessel loop. We cured the bone and we found the vessel loop entering the subarctic fossa and uh, which is super lateral to the internal between meters. We cured the posterior wall with the meters and uh, this is the proximal of the ICA. Uh, for this patient, the hearing is not serviceable. So we graduated the feeding artery. The patient was located in to the tumor. The tumor feeding artery was graduated. And we cut the vestibular cochlear bundle at the brain stain. The patient was preserved here. And then we performed the debarking of the tumor. And then the over the intermediate component of the tumor. The intermediate feeding artery was controlled with coagulation. Feeding artery. And then you stimulated the facial nerve, located the anterior to the tumor. This is a vestibular nerve. We cut the vestibular nerve, and performed the dissection, and the facial nerve was preserved well. Confirmed there was no resident tumor. We stimulated the facial nerve at the brain stem. You can see all the procedure was performed from the perivascular space. In a, other cases, this is a case where also remove the tumor from the perivascular space. All the space uh, superior between and inferior can be used to, to debark the tumor. These tumors are not very large. After debarking the tumor, you know, we can find the facial nerve located inferior to the tumor. We stimulated the facial nerve and the tumor feeding artery was controlled with speculation. The hearing was non-serviceable, so we cut the vestibular 
popular condo and uh, the rental rupture of the ICA occurred and we adjusted the retract. It was a, a branch which supplies a hot so we uh, had a two graduated the branch and divided it. And then uh, so we continually remove the tumor. We cured the bone, uh, cut the dura, and uh, cured the bone. The dura linings, the uh, subacrophosa, was used to protect the vessel loop. You can see it entering the uh, subacrophosa. But we didn't know the depth of the subacrophosa uh, loop entering the subacrophosa. This is a internal acoustic meters. We remove the tumor inside of the meters. And we can the feeding artery from the dura. You can see all the procedure was performed from the uh, perivascular space. It also put the artery loop uh, at the risk of injury. And uh, then we can found uh, the facial nerve located anterior to the tumor. It was uh, dissected along the retinoid plane. It was preserved. And uh, we quickly removed the tumor. The fissioner was preserved and we stimulated it with a brain stain. Uh, from the fifth case, with a type 3 anomalous subject loop, and uh, we removed the tumor after releasing the eye cut from subject to fossa. Uh, in this patient, we can see the vessel loop is located behind the tumor without the displacement of the ICA. We cannot expose the tumor. In this case, we found the deep subarctic fossa sign. And we, uh, after a retinoid dissection, we can identify the pattern of ICA entering and exiting the subarctic fossa. And as we draw the bone around the subarctic fossa of a loop, we know the dips so we can do more drilling. And uh, we drilled about uh, 2070 degree to the circumstance to expose the subarctic loop. We should expose the founders of the subject fossa. We should do more theory. For this case, uh, completely release the, the vessel loop with the dura is impossible. So we, uh, so we open the, the dura. We found uh, uh, inside of the subject fossa, the vessel loop do not adhere to the uh, dura. So we can open the, the dura and uh, then we elevated the vessel loop. And uh, then we can found uh, the subarctic artery here. Here is the subarctic artery. We graduated it and divided it. Then we can elevate the vessel loop. So, we divided it and the artery was completely obliterated. But at the orifice of the subarctic fossa, the dura adhered tightly to the vessel loop. So we uh, uh, cut the dura and then released the ICA with a slip of, slip of dura. Yeah, this is the dura. We wrapped the other vessel loop. And then we mobilized this artery loop uh, immediately, inferiorly, to expose the tumor. The internal 
of posterior meatus located anterior to the subacute fossa. So then two modules into this code the internal posterior meatus. You can see abnormal uh, bone petrous bone here. And there are certain outcomes. And the focus of uh, better infraction occurred in one patient, case four, and I show you this was caused by an adventure rupture of a cortical supply of bronchial echo during adjustment of the retractor. And the coagulation was quite prematurely bleeding. We can see after the operation as their focus of better infraction. This patient had a, an aesthetic age after surgery and had a fully recovered three weeks later. And a no ischemic complication related to the ICA was observed in other 15 cases after surgery. And the total tumor removal was achieved in all patients. And the continuity of facial nerve was anatomically preserved in 15 cases. Uh, but in one case, the facial nerve was just located at the dorsal aspect of the tumor. In this case, the facial nerve cannot be preserved. So we perform a neurography with a graft of the lesser occipital nerve for this patient. And there was no mortality, no patient developed a CSF leakage. And uh, uh, the hearing, one patient would preserve the hearing. And, uh, uh, at the last follow-up, the, fun the patient nerve function was classified as grade one in seven cases, and the grade two in two cases, grade three in four cases, and grade four in three cases. No patients developed tumor recurrence. Our embryology for cases. And uh, in the fatal stage, the subacute loop might be close to the orifice of the subacute fossa. It gives rise to the subacute pocket artery. After birth, the subacute fossa constantly narrows and forces the neural connectivity to fuse with the subacute loop, which causes the information of type 2 anomalous subacute loop. If the subacute loop protruded into the natural subacute fossa, it can preclude the obliteration of the subacute fossa leading to the formation of deep subacute fossa and a type 3 anomalous subacute loop. Anomalous petrous hyperplasia can, um, can deepen the osseous penetration of type 3 anomalous subacute loop. For type 1, we cannot understand it. Some unknown facts may contribute to the filling of tumor capsule and the subacute loop to the origin of the subacute artery. Uh, diagnostic dilemma. Uh, in the literature, uh, some authors use some advanced uh, technique to evaluate this anatomic variation, uh, but uh, they cannot, can only reveal the vessel in contact with the uh, subacute fossa. Uh, this cannot distinguish the artery, whether the artery is embedded in the dura or embedded in the bone. They cannot uh, predict the dips of the artery loop in the subacute fossa. So um, Professor Roten considered the best plan was to be simply be aware of this anomaly. And uh, after the fifth case, we found the deeper subacute fossa site. Uh, to determine the size of the subacute fossa, the widers and deeps was measured. The subacute fossa on, pre on, on the operative side was retrospectively measured on preoperative thin sliced temporal bone in all our patients by two independent neuroradiologists in our hospital who did not know whether an anomalous subacute loop was presented. Uh, on preoperative thin slice temporal bone, we can see the subacute fossa was eroded by the 
in Chamiato component in 85 patients. The subacrofosa was eroded. And uh, the subacrofosa was covered with a thin bony lamina in 26 patients. And uh, the dips was, was measured in 80, 852 patients. We can see the red point was uh, seven patients with a type three anomalous subject loop. They rented 2.3 to 7.0 millimeters, which was significantly larger than other patients without anomalous uh, penetrating subject loop. When the dips exceeded uh, two millimeters, the sensitivity of diagnosis of type three anomalous subject loop was uh, 100%, uh, but the precision was uh, about 31.3. Uh, uh, we, we found uh, 22 patients with a subacrofosa, the dips exceeded, exceeded the two millimeters. Uh, the subacrofosa was usually a uh, funnel shape, but uh, among the patient with a type three anomalous subacrofosa loop, the uh, subacrofosa with a uh, near spherical uh, tubular uh, shape. And uh, on 3D reconstruction, we can see the anomalous subacrofosa located uh, just uh, posterior to the internal acoustic meters in case nine. And uh, the significance, we, we, we consider the evaluation of the subacrofosa it be included in the, in the bony anatomy of the tender from the thin side uh, temporal bone scan before CP angle surgery. If the depth of the subacrofosa exceeds two millimeters, especially when the subacrofosa is a spherical or tub tubular in shape, we should uh, be aware of the type three anomalous subject loop. For such cases, AICA experiment should be included in your surgery search plan. And the suboxital model approach is recommended. The translab or middle fossa approach should not be used because there is often only minimal or no proximal control of ICA if the other world is open. Uh, because this sign can predict the ICA in the bone, so it can guided during the bone around the vessel loop. In this case, we can see the, the subarcate fossa is not so deep, so can, we can do more drilling. We cut the dura, and uh, then we found the vessel loop entering the subarcate fossa because it is not very deep, so we can do more drilling to expose the bottom and uh, the subarcate artery. Um, this is the subarctic arteries. We can do more drilling to expose the artery. And then we can graduate it and divide it the artery at the bottom of the subarctic fossa. And then we can mobilize the vessel loop along with a cup of dura, just uh, as type in type two. The dura is stripped from the subarctic fossa here. Here is the subarctic fossa, and the vessel loop mobilized immediately and to expose the tumor. So ICA displacement is recommended to expose the tumor. Our limitation uh, an analysis of more cases was a type three with a normal subject loop identified during CP angle surgery, not only during Vestibular so removal is needed to verify this sign. 
preoperative type discovery of a deep subarthroposa required further advanced image, such as CTA, MRA, or DSA, to help reveal the existence of a, a sub, uh, and more details of a type 3 anomalous subarthroposa loop. Take home message. And the three types of normal subarch loop of ICA may be encountered during the plasma normal removal. ICA displacement is recommended before tumor removal. The deep subarch fossa sign on thin sliced temporal bone CT may indicate the existence of a type 3 anomalous subarch loop. This sign can be used to predict the dips of the ICA in the bone and guide the building of the bone around the vessel. Thank you very much. Welcome to Shanghai. So Professor Shuming, it was a nice lecture and we have discussed this, this issue with the very non neurosurgeons dealing with acute neuroma surgery around the world. And even surgeons with more than thousand patients operated, they told me that they had never seen the intraosseous loop of the eye, but we have seen this before here in our department. Um, actually, we have operated around 60 to 8 uh, acoustic neuromas patients per year here in our institute. Uh, I've worked with Professor Hamina, that is a very known neurosurgeon uh, for dealing with acoustic neuroma patients, and we have seen these cases before. The problem is that you always consider, not in your case, but when I discussed this previously, all surgeons, they have this concept that they must detach and preserve the dura, and then to follow with a common opening of the internal auditory canal. But in my opinion, this may drive you to a mistake because in case of type three loop, as you have demonstrated in your class, if you force the dura or cut the dura in the entrance of the internal auditory canal, you may injure the, the eye. Even though you have uh, this distal loop that uh, do not interfere in, in the vascularization of the brain stem, but uh, it's unpredictable what is going to happen with the cerebellum. And some, in some cases, you may have a massive edema. In your case, you, you didn't have the patient that had injury to the eye. It was a small part, and the patient recovered nicely. But the fact is, you do not have how to predict the consequence of this injury, right? So you must just try to preserve in every case this loop. And uh, until now, we didn't have any uh, factor to observe in MRI or CT that could uh, make us aware about this intraosseous loop that is the most dangerous one. Uh, and in your paper, you demonstrate that when you have this depth fossa, you may may, uh, may find this, this kind of patient. So it was really nice. The acoustic neuromas uh, are really challenging. And uh, today, as we have too many surgeons around the world indicating gamma-knife for this patient. We are not able uh, or we are not allowed to have bad results. Huh? And uh, this is a real challenge and it was really nice how you presented. And so congratulations on your work. And uh, we look forward to see you personally some way in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. May I ask one question, Professor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, pro Professor, uh, you, you did show that the CTA may be used uh, to diagnose. Uh, uh, so uh, do, do you now uh, actually uh, uh, going to do uh, angiographic study for all uh, swanoma since it's only 1.7% of your case uh, to, to identify the loop? My second question, Professor, uh, in a very difficult case, uh, will you anticipate the need to do an uh, end-to-end uh, anastomosis, Professor? Yes, uh, from the fifth case, we found the deeper subarcular 
uh, both are signed. And uh, we, uh, if we, uh, and the deep subarchitect of both are signed was presented in cooperative since I Temple Pung City. Uh, we, we can do the CTA examination to identify the work, whether there was a normless uh, subject loop. Uh, this can help us to, to identify the existence. Yeah. Uh, would, would you possible to tell us what is the sensitivity of a CTA after you detect some abnormalities in your uh, uh, MRI, where you suspect they may have a, a loop uh, and, and, and you proceed with CTA, what's the sensitivity uh, of a CTA uh, and, and compare with the intra-optity finding, Professor? We, we didn't reveal this, uh, this, uh, in this other loop in MRI. How about Professor Gastevo? How, how you decide when you need to do a CTA in, in those cases, Professor? CTA, in some cases, we can find the vessel loop entering the subarctic loop. Uh, sub we can find as I, as I understand in your paper, you you try to see this that fossa in all your yeah. cases, right? 900. And, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. found yeah. every. And, and every time you find, you found this that fossa, the patient had the group, right? So it, uh, it, it was that, right? Yeah, it's a retrospective study. So from, from, from now, we can do some prospective research on the CTA yeah. or MRA. Yeah. Uh, actually, we, we are not doing CTA for all patients. We do CTA. Uh, bone CT, yeah. not yeah, CT for our patients. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and, and I, I don't know to do end end to end bypasses is a possibility, but I think that as you shown in your cases, even though you have this intraosseous loop, you may try to dissect the, the internal auditory canal from the lower part and then to avoid mm -hmm. the subarcuate fossa. And then to get into the, the IEC uh, safely. The problem is that if you have a high right jugular bone, right? And I don't know, uh, as maybe, maybe uh, these are two rare situations, and probably this is not often. But if you have a high right jugular bone and a subarquate loop, then uh, you have a real problem. And then you may consider bypass or even go to, in some cases, uh, as, as I commonly say, uh, we are looking the best patient for each treatment, right? And then in some cases, uh, if you have this loop with high riding bulb, the jugular bulb, uh, you may try to, to leave some residual tumor, only in these cases when the risk is too high for the patient. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I think that by that, even though you do bypasses, it's not uh, clear that they are going to work in the post-operative period, right? So uh, you should try to work nicely as you did. I, I have another question, Professor. You show one case that uh, uh, when you do retraction uh, with the cortical branch of the eye card that been ruptured. Uh, so in that case, I saw that you you try to remove the tumor without release the, the, the loop. So uh, in some cases, do you advocate that if you're able to remove the tumor without releasing the loop, is also feasible, uh, Professor? Yeah, for the first four cases, we remove the tumor from the perivascular space. For the last three cases, we found the deep subarcuate fossa sign, and then we can do more drilling and then release the ICA. So the expressment of the ICA is recommended if you know the deeper subarcuate fossa sign. How about Professor Castillo? Yes. And it's important, it's important to note that when you face this variation, uh, you have this loop 
intraosseous loop because if the, 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 the vessel is in the dura, you may detach the dura, preserve the dura, and then cut in the entrance of the internal or canal or even go open the, uh, the meatus and then to, to remove the dura with the vessel safely. But if you have this intraosseous bridge, maybe you should open uh, the enough space to work inside the, the internal auditory canal and and do not force to remove the vessel from the bone because they do not tolerate well this, this maneuver. And in these cases, you may use also, uh, it's not very common to use, but you may use this, this tool that is the endoscopy to try to see the fundus working, preserving the dura with the vessel and then removing the tumor from the, the lower portion to the fundus. And then it's probably more easily to do that, to try to remove the vessel because they will not uh, uh, tolerate it well. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, zooming for very nice, interesting uh, cases and the discussion. And thanks to Professor Gastevo Jung for, uh, for, uh, for your feedback. And uh, probably we can get a last uh, uh, closing uh, uh, comment from you, Professor Gastevo, before we close the session. Uh, it, it, it is a, always a pleasure to me to join with you guys and uh, to see such nice presentations. And now we learn some new concepts and some new signs. We may look into the CT to decide if we may go uh for a radical resection with risk or no if you have this vessel root in, in the bone and yeah it's a great job so thank you and congratulations thank you thank you very much yeah. Yeah, thank you thank you very much i forgot uh professor takashi kon is here professor takashi kon do you have any question before we close the session professor thank Hello, you uh uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the lecture. So, uh, uh, thank you for the lecture. I'm Takashi Kong from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I attended during the, uh, the website is um, unstable. So, uh, thank you for the lecture. So, I, I have no questions. So, I, I've got this one over. So, very informative lecture. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm not familiar with the uh, uh, one over. So, but uh, I, I learned a lot of the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Thank you Professor, for, for joining us. So now I close uh, this session officially on behalf of the Education Committee and the SNS President, uh, Professor Kokato. I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Kiyoshi Takagi and Professor Zumi, as well as our chairs, Professor Vijaya Sheka and Professor Kastevo Jung for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I would like also to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And today we have around uh, uh, 720 people who join us live. So until we meet again on Saturday, it's bye-bye for both of us. Thank you very much for joining.